Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Kambis Ranavardi, board member for Columbia DC and a graduate of School of Engineering and Applied Science. First, I would like to thank our co-sponsors for this e event, uh, Harvard Club of Washington DC uh, and their members, also uh, National Women's History uh, Museum uh, for and their members for joining us uh, in this uh, um, in this conversation. Uh, we are very privileged to have Tomiko brown Negan, Dean of Harvard Radcliffe Institute, Professor of Constitutional Law, as well as Professor of History at Harvard University to talk to us about her recent book, Civil Rights Queen, Constance Baker Motley and the Struggle for Equality. And uh, our host uh, would be my uh, colleague at Columbia DC, fellow board member, Rhonda Colvin, and uh, she is a senior political correspondent for the Washington Post. Tomiko Brown Nagin is Dean of Harvard Radcliffe Institute. She's also uh, uh, Daniel uh, P.S. Paul Professor of Constitutional Law at Harvard Law School and a Professor of History at Harvard University. An award-winning legal historian and an expert in constitutional law and education law and policy. She's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Law Institute, the American Philosophical Society, a fellow of the American Bar Foundation, a distinguished lecturer for the organization of American historian, historians, and a member of the board of directors of ProPublica. Without further ado, sending it to Rhonda. All right, thank you so much, Cambies, and thank you for everyone who has joined us, and also to our guest this evening, uh, Tomiko Brown Nagan. Good to see you. Welcome. Good to see you, Rhonda. We uh, would like to start off with a reading. You uh, have uh, picked out a portion that you would like to share with everyone, and, and we'll go ahead and start that now. Wonderful, thank you. And thank you, Rhonda, for serving as my interlocutor. I also want to thank the programming committee of the Columbia University Club of DC for hosting me uh, this evening. I am really delighted to be with you. And I am going to start with a reading from a chapter in my book on Motley's most famous case. And that was the battle to desegregate the University of Mississippi, Ole Miss. This man has got to be crazy. Thurgood Marshall yelled to Motley in January of 1961, that's your case. Marshall had descended upon Motley's office waving a letter from James Meredith. The missive contained such a preposterous idea that Marshall thought the writer must be out of his mind. I am submitting an application for admission to the University of Mississippi, Meredith wrote, and I am anticipating encountering difficulty with the various agencies here in the state. In view of the brewing trouble, Meredith requested Marshall's legal assistance. After Marshall had finished laughing about Meredith's proposal to sue Ole Miss, he washed his hands of the case. Marshall knew Motley had the smarts and the courtroom skills to do the job, and he thought her gender would be an advantage. The fight to desegregate Ole Miss might get someone killed, but in the context of Mississippi's white supremacist, yet chivalrous culture, as Marshall saw it, a black woman would fare better than a black man. Any white supremacist, he opined, would scarcely think twice about murdering a black man, but might hesitate to lynch a black woman. Yet the very idea of a black woman lawyer violently clashed with the worldview of Dugas Shands Esquire, the white male lawyer who defended Ole Miss. Shands refused to address the ink fund lawyer in the customary manner as Mrs. Motley. Instead, he used only indirect references, calling Motley her or she. At one point early on, Motley jumped to her feet in a bid to put an end to the charade. But the tipping point occurred when Shands called her Constance. Motley immediately objected. I would like for Mr. Shands not to call me by my first name, Motley insisted. Henceforth, the lawyer referred to Motley as the New York Council. After months of struggle and endless delays, Meredith had had enough. Browbeaten by white resistance, Meredith wrote to Motley resigned. 
I will not attempt to obtain an undergraduate degree from the University of Mississippi, the letter proclaimed. Keenly aware that Motley, who had poured herself into the case, would be disappointed in his decision, Meredith pleaded for understanding. I am human after all, he wrote. Meredith had grown tired of waiting for a deliverance that never came. Life had passed him by. His peers had graduated from college, begun careers, and moved on with their lives. In the meantime, he and his family had endured a high cost, literally and figuratively, fighting to integrate the University of Mississippi. Motley was stunned by the message. In order to salvage her case and support her client, she morphed from lawyer to therapist, a role she often played in high stakes civil rights cases. To get a handle on the fraught situation, the pair would talk in Motley's New York City apartment where Meredith could taste freedom. There, Motley cajoled Meredith. She persuaded him that he had gone too far and that too much had been invested in the case by the Inc. Fund and the Federal Court of Appeals to abandon the litigation. Just as Meredith reached his breaking point, support arrived precisely as Motley had promised. On September 10th, 1962, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black intervened, halting any further action, preventing James Meredith's matriculation to Ole Miss. While in Mississippi, Motley built community with a small band of lawyers and activists who took part in LDF's effort to end Jim Crow in the state. She leaned on Becker Evers, the NAACP's most prominent operative in Mississippi, who often invited Motley to his home where she enjoyed home-cooked meals and fellowship with Evers, his wife, and their children. But only one month after Motley left Mississippi for the last time, Megger Evers was assassinated. It devastated her. Motley couldn't get out of her bed for weeks following his death. She couldn't even bring herself to attend his funeral. Nevertheless, she had left the state victorious. Constance Baker Motley emerged as one of the most respected lawyers in America. A story in the New York Times titled Integrations Advocate captures the professional heights to which Motley has soared. A tall, striking woman with piercing dark eyes is almost always in the courtroom in the eye of the hurricane surrounding the struggle for civil rights in the South. Motley's fight to desegregate Ole Miss brought her public esteem and professional success along with devastating loss and profound pain. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I've read the book and I know that that chapter felt very vivid when reading it. You could almost see it happening in the ways you're describing how she played such a central role in the civil rights movement and all the key people that she knew. Um, and I also want to remind those who are joining us that if uh, during the question and answer period, if there are any questions you would like to ask, we will try to take some of those uh, toward the end of this session. You can use the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of your screen. If you click on more, it'll give you an option to enter questions there, and I will try to get to them uh, toward the end of our talk tonight. But uh, for starters, Dean Nagan, if you could just tell us, for those who haven't had a chance to read the book just yet, if you could tell us uh, briefly what uh, the book is about and sort of all the, the layers of trailblazing that Motley did. I would be happy to. The book is titled Civil Rights Queen, which was the uh, honorific that uh, Motley earned because of her exploits as a civil rights lawyer, um, who worked alongside Thurgood Marshall and other, other well-known lawyers to really give us an America in which formal racial equality under law was possible and sometimes even achievable. Uh, case Alabama, Georgia, and other cases uh, fighting for civil rights. She, after um, uh, that she became a politician. She was the first Manhattan borough president who was female and also the first black woman elected to the New York Senate where she uh, was, she served in the legislature alongside uh, Shirley Chisholm from 66 because she was so well known and had such a, an excellent reputation as a lawyer 
uh, President Johnson appointed her to the federal bench, making her the first, the very first black woman to be appointed a federal judge. And so she is a captivating figure uh, whom I chose to write about because I, uh, when I started the book, I, I realized that she really had not received her due as an historical figure. And I think that it's important for her to be more widely known and happy to have played a role in uh, that beginning to happen through this book. And your book, sort of the, the publishing of it, actually parallels a historic moment in our country's history where we now have the first uh, female Black justice on the Supreme Court, Ketanji Brown Jackson. Um, and that's one of the reasons we wanted to highlight uh, Motley's career tonight. Uh, you mentioned that you wanted to write about this because she was somewhat of an unknown figure historically, even though she accomplished so much. Um, what do you think is the reason why she isn't as well known? Mm -hmm. Well, just to be clear, there, there, there are those who um, have, have known of Motley for a very long time, lawyers uh, and people familiar with uh, New York City, uh, excuse me, the, the New York courts, the federal court there, uh, for instance. What she has not, uh, had not been able to achieve was um, you know, being a household name in the way that Martin Luther King Jr. is a household name or Thurgood Marshall uh, alongside, um, who she litigated alongside. And, and why is that? Well, I'm afraid it all comes down to gender and to race. Um, in Western societies, historical significance is uh, coded males. We think of, of men and typically charismatic men as those who are worthy of being remembered and memorialized and having biographies written about them. Uh, so many women across history ha who, who did tremendous things have escaped uh, notice in the, in the are we back together? Yes. We are, yes, yes. We um, we mentioned that there are some uh, bad storms, at least here in DC. Um, in fact, I, I just saw a flash of lightning uh, reflected. <laughs> so um, it's such as life with uh, yes. virtual talks. Absolutely. But yeah, to get back on track, you were talking about how she isn't as well known as some of the male figures in the civil rights movement and throughout history. So if you want to pick back on that. Yes, uh, I was saying that the explanation for that does come down to gender and to race, because uh, in Western societies, historical significance is really coded male. Um, so across time, there have been women who were important political figures, social activists, uh, who ha have not been um, treated as such in historical texts and scholarly text. And that is true even in the civil rights historiography, where I was mentioning that it's only been in the last 20 years or so that there have been biographies written of people like Ella Baker and uh, Pauli Murray and, and others who deserve to be remembered because they were there in the trenches alongside the men. And so I am adding through this book, Motley, to those figures who really deserve to be remembered. She has so much to teach us. She's so relatable in many ways, including because uh, as we saw from uh, 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 the uh, justices, Justice Jackson's uh, introduction, she is a, a role model. She's inspirational um, for so many people, and she should be. Hmm. And touching on uh, Judge Jackson, she did mention throughout her confirmation period that Motley was an inspiration for her. Um, I know that Motley has also been a mentor to clerks uh, and also some other figures we may know. Who, who are some people we might know who inspired her as she's talked about being her mentor or mentees of her? Yeah, so the two figures, um, well, in the inspiration category, the vice president Kamala Harris has cited uh, Motley over and over again. And uh, in terms of mentees, there's a whole range of figures. The person who um, uh, jumps out is Dorothy Roberts, who is a 
scholar uh, of uh, race, uh, legal, a law professor uh, who is well known, who talks about um, the, the ways in which Motley inspired her. Um, and there are so many others. And the thing that's so significant, um, uh, Rhonda, about Motley and her law clerks is that she actually applied or, or the, as the spirits in the letter of the Civil Rights Act in her own chambers. Um, she hired law clerks, women and African-Americans and other people of color who were, who had, you know, wonderful credentials, but who were not getting looks from other judges. She was one of the first judges, federal judges to do that. And um, she hired people who knew about her uh, career often as a lawyer and who wanted to be in her presence. And she did not disappoint, although she was known as a taskmaster and a workaholic. Um, uh, she also supported her uh, clerks. And there's a story that I tell in the book about um, a clerk whom she came upon one day who was in tears at her desk and said to Motley that you know, she was always known to be smart and uh, charming and it had served her well thus far, but in this law clerkship, judicial clerkship, she finally come upon something that was really giving her trouble. She'd been found out. And Motley uh, said to her without missing a beat, oh, you know, don't worry. I've been waiting for people to find me out for 30 years and it hasn't happened yet. And so that's just a delightful way um, to reassure and validate uh, a young person in that position. And I, I just, there's so many stories uh, like that about Motley, although she had really high standards for her clerk, she, um, uh, she understood that people have their moments. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's important to tell those stories, to humanize Motley, and also because she's modeling um, a, a type of uh, behavior that I personally uh, uh, find important and try to emulate. And I think uh, a lot of others do too. And uh, she did all of that, although she had not, um, when she joined the court, she had not been fully welcomed and embraced. She had not had um, uh, you know, fellow judges who had done, um, who, who had helped her to acculturate. And uh, I'll, I'll end this answer by noting that one of the people whom she welcomed onto the bench was Justice Sonia Sotomayor, who joined the uh, Southern District of New York federal court as Motley was cycling off to senior status. And so she not only supported uh, law clerks, but other women judges who came after her and other um, judges across uh, the span, spanning um, uh, race and gender and uh, background. Hmm. When it comes to being a woman at that time and in the law profession, I mean, we know of the struggles Ruth Bader Ginsburg has talked about. Uh, and others, of course. What were some of the sacrifices that Motley experienced when she was working uh, at the NAACP LDF? Uh, and I believe that was around the, the time her son, her uh, only child, was born. Right. There are a number of examples. I, I will start off by um, contrasting her experience, initial experience, at the Ink Fund um, uh, with Thurgood Marshall and um, her experience applying to law firms in New York City uh, where people essentially closed the door in her face um, because she was a woman uh, and a black woman, not, not to mention that. And this was a common experience um, well after she graduated from law school for people like Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Sandra Day O'Connor. And so it continued. Um, she had the experiences of, of many women um, uh, who were graduates of law school. Um, and then she was hired on the spot by Thurgood Marshall when she came to the uh, Ink Fund looking for work. And yet, as I describe in the book, 
um, she also had her challenges there. One of them related to the fact that as she and the other lawyers were litigating uh, Brown versus Board of Education, which went to the U.S. Supreme Court twice, she became pregnant and gave birth to her first child. Uh, and so she was trying to juggle all of the um, things that any lawyer, high-powered lawyer, has to when litigating an important case and also um, uh, acclimating to being a, a mother. And, uh, you know, it, it just wasn't easy uh, to be a woman in the first place. And then she was a, a woman who um, had had a, a child. And so that was one of the challenges. Um, she encountered challenges when she litigated uh, in the South, as I described in that reading where she was subject to disrespect. Um, uh, she, uh, people didn't know what to do with her. Um, and, and there were many people who were threatened by her. Um, uh, there's a passage in the book where I, I describe her recounting how people were just sort of amazed by her, the way she spoke, uh, the way she looked, um, and some were disrespectful, including courtroom lawyers. Uh, at the same time, there were women and African Americans in many small towns who adored her, were fascinated by her in, in the positive sense and would line the walls of uh, the, the courtroom to see the Black woman lawyer from New York doing things that Black people and women just didn't do. And that was to challenge male authority figures, to ask them to justify their discriminatory policies. To act, She was an ace cross-examiner, um, and she would get these men on the stand and through question by important question, reveal that really there was no justification um, for the, the discriminatory uh, practices. And that is, that is how she won so many important cases. I noticed in the book you spent a lot of time um, in some of the earlier chapters when you're talking about her work with some of these early cases, civil rights cases, of how uh, other lawyers in uh, some of the southern states that she was traveling in, how they treated her, how they approached her, and that there were indignities, whether when she faced certain judges or other lawyers on the other side. Talk about those indignities and how she handled them. Hmm. Well, she litigated um, in the Florida Supreme Court and had uh, a, a judge there uh, who literally turned his back on her um, and who responded to her uh, citing legal cases by just being openly racist um, uh, and you know, just arguing that Blacks didn't belong because they were inferior, unlike uh, whites. Um, she encountered um, opposing counsel who, as I described with Duga Shands, wouldn't shake her hand, um, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't interact with her uh, as an equal. And I have to tell you, uh, Rhonda, in part because of her background, um, and we, I, I hope I'll have the opportunity to talk about that, she was bewildered um, by some of that reaction. Um, that is, she couldn't understand how um, this lawyer, after all, he was a lawyer, he had gone to law school, um, couldn't appreciate that she had graduated from Columbia Law School and she had been litigating uh, and winning cases. She really saw herself as, if anything, um, a much better credential than uh, these lawyers, and she was just sort of flummoxed by the behavior because she had grown up in a context that was very different in New Haven, Connecticut, and just had not experienced some of the um, just outrageous uh, disrespect that she did encounter in the places like Mississippi and Alabama. Another thing I want to add to that is it wasn't just the disrespect, it was that as an African-American, um, even as she was litigating these cases, she experienced some of the same disadvantages as her clients. So she couldn't 
um, eat in uh, white-owned restaurants. Uh, she often lost weight when she traveled because she had to either you know, get uh, food, um, snacks, while, she's, while she was trying to litigate from uh, stores instead of being able to have meals from restaurants or she had to rely on the kindness of, of uh, friends um, or sometimes strangers in the black community to eat. Um, I tell a story about how when she was litigating the University of Georgia case, which is in Athens, uh, she had to, she and Vernon Jordan had to drive back and forth from Atlanta where they could find housing uh, to Athens every day. Um, and I've driven from Athens to, to Atlanta. It seems like it's doable, but it's, it's really not. It was tiring. Um, and so that, that was a part of what she experienced uh, as a civil rights lawyer, a woman on the road in the South, um, often under threat of her life as she was when she was in Mississippi with Megger Evers. Um, to tell you another story, um, when she was being driven um, back and forth from to, to the courthouse uh, by Megger Evers, uh, they would often be tailed by the state police. And he would say things to her as they were driving along, um, like, don't look back. We're being followed. Put away your legal pad. Put it inside the New York Times because you didn't want to be caught um, uh, demonstrably violating white supremacy in Mississippi. So it was really a, a tough, a challenging time for her. And she was not only a brilliant lawyer, lawyer but courageous, courageous um, to, to do this work. And, and that, that's just you know, some of the reason that uh, she's such an inspiring figure and um, the, the type of person uh, whom uh, Associate Justice Jackson would hold up as, as a light, as a, as a beacon uh, for her many years later. That's, I mean, that's, that's so phenomenal when you put it in those words that she experienced those same things her clients did. It wasn't abstract. She was also fighting those inequities as well. Um, at a time where, like you, I'm glad you mentioned that point about having to stay elsewhere or bring snacks. It wasn't an easy road for her. Um, and I know, you know, just from my own reporting that I've done on uh, points in the civil rights movement, there were journalists and other workers in the civil rights movement who had to stay at funeral homes mm -hmm. because they couldn't stay at the local hotels. So it's just thank you for giving us that uh, the context behind what she was uh, working on. Um, you did mention that you want to talk a little bit about her background uh, coming from an immigrant family. So her parents were from the Caribbean. Uh, how did that shape her ideas of race, ideas of inequity, and how she would later approach them in life? Yeah, it's very important uh, to, to understanding Constance Baker Motley. Her parents were from Nevis in the West Indies, came to this country in the early 20th century. They were working class. And her father worked at Yale, as did virtually every male member of her family, um, working in the eating houses and doing other, um, uh, you know, they, they were laborers at, at Yale. And yet the, the story that I tell is that these their, their working class status and their relation to elites at Yale did not breed resentment. Um, instead, her father in particular read the privilege of his young, white, wealthy charges into himself. And it buttressed his belief that West Indians were special and certainly superior to Black Americans. You know, he did not let his children play with the Black migrants from the South. He thought and, and taught that they allowed themselves to be debased by Jim Crow, that they were, you know, they couldn't get ahead because they didn't work hard enough. And so it really was sort of a cartoonish understanding of American race relations 
um, and yet one that it was important to, to write about because, of course, there are these intergroup dynamics that are um, very relevant to understanding the broader uh, Black community. They also were socially conservative. They were religious. Um, uh, her father followed all the gender conventions. And so when she told her parents that she not only wanted to go to college, but wanted to be a lawyer, they thought it was just ridiculous. Um, how could she possibly think that she could uh, go to college, which was impractical. Very few people at that time went to college, but here was this working class girl in New Haven, uh, uh, with that aspiration and then the aspiration to go to law school. And I will say she developed those aspirations because she did have a pretty nurturing school environment. She attended integrated schools in New Haven where she learned about uh, James Weldon Johnson and W.B. Du Bois. Uh, she, George Crawford, a, a black man from Alabama, uh, who became, a, who attended, graduated from Yale Law School, became the Corporation Counsel for the City of New Haven, was an important figure who introduced her to the NAACP's uh, uh, cases challenging uh, discrimination. So it was a, a, a fascinating uh, context um, uh, for her to develop her aspirations. And on the point of her father having these ideas of inferiority about Black Americans, I conclude that either because of or despite those teachings, she went on to be the civil rights queen. Um, she did develop a very strong consciousness as a teenager of inequality. A lot of it had to do with her class status um, because she didn't have the money to go to college and um, it, that was deeply felt, not so much uh, uh, the race because it was a a, it was not segregated in the way the South was, but all of that was channeled eventually into a desire to work for equality at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And so her, her background, vitally important to understanding uh, who she was. And uh, she continued to be, um, you know, her, her family thought of, uh, her family members saw themselves as subjects of the British Empire. They, you know, they, they liked tea and all of the things that, that one would. Um, played God Save the Queen on the upright piano. Uh, and, and so it's a, it was a, a, an important and, and eye-opening um, context uh, to, to write about for this book. Really adds to the types of figures who represent the struggle for equality in the United States. You mentioned how her parents said, you you know, you know, can't go off and do all of this, get all this education. They wanted her to perhaps go in a different direction. How did she find herself um, at Columbia Law or even before that at NYU? How, what was her path through higher education? Yes, well, this, this allows me to talk about the importance of philanthropy. Um, because she did have uh, a, a supporter, a white uh, man in New Haven who was a graduate of Yale. He was a wealthy contractor who, after hearing her speak at a civic uh, organization, uh, called her into a, his office and asked why wasn't she in college and learned that she couldn't afford to be in college. Um, and he, he offered to uh, subsidize her college and even uh, her, her law school career. And so she said it was like a fairy tale um, to be plucked out and, and have her ability uh, supported by this gentleman who not only uh, paid for her education, but importantly and uh, remarkably, he would write her letters uh, when she was away at school um, uh, just helping her uh, go on to continue, you know, um, supporting her. And so what just what a terrific um, uh, moment uh, and, and story to tell about how Motley was able to uh, achieve um, or begin to achieve uh, all that she did 
um, through the support of uh, really a stranger who could see her ability um, and who wanted to help her. Hmm. When it comes to her time on the federal bench, what are some cases that uh, people might know the results of or maybe uh, benefit from right now that she was involved with? Yes, the, the first case, um, uh, important case that I will tell you about is Blank versus Sullivan and Cromwell, which was a uh, sex discrimination uh, case brought by uh, females who had graduated from law school, a lot of them had attended uh, New York University Law School, um, and who claimed that they had not been hired by the prestigious New York law firms. If they were, were not promoted uh, as men were, did not receive the same opportunities or the same pay. And they challenged this under the Civil Rights Act. Uh, Motley drew the case, and at the time um, in the Southern District, there, there was a wheel uh, that the clerk would spin, and uh, all of the judges' names would be inside the wheel, and at this time, Motley drew the case. Um, but the, the lawyer for Sullivan Cromwell um, uh, thought that she was unsuited to be the lawyer in the case, although it was a random assignment. Um, and that was because she had been a civil rights lawyer. And he said, and he wrote her a letter saying this, because as a woman, she likely had experienced discrimination herself. And so she would be biased um, against the firm. Uh, and uh, he actually not only wrote her a letter uh, challenging her ability to remain on the case, but eventually filed a recusal motion asking her um, to step aside. She did not step aside. Um, instead, she wrote an opinion that is still cited uh, for the proposition that race or gender or identity alone are not enough um, uh, to substantiate a claim of bias against a uh, federal judge. She actually turned the lawyer's argument on its head saying that if race or gender or practice background alone were enough to disqualify a judge, then no judge on the court could hear the case. Because of course, white men uh, who perhaps have been corporate lawyers have practice backgrounds and a race and a gender too. Um, a really important case that has been cited by um, judges who have dealt with recusal motions on the basis of race and gender um, and uh, LBGTQ status. Uh, so a really important case. And she went on, by the way, um, to approve a settlement in the Sullivan and Cromwell case that uh, opened the doors of New York City law firms to uh, qualified women. And of course, this meant that years after she had had the door closed in her face, she actually uh, was played a pivotal role in uh, allowing, um, uh, facilitating opportunity for other women, people like me who came along uh, much later and worked in one of those uh, prestigious New York City law firms. Another case that I will cite uh, involved Martin Sostre, who was a uh, 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 Puerto Rican, Black Puerto Rican, um, who wound up in the federal prison uh, and on trumped up drug charges and challenged his treatment by the wardens. He argued that um, their uh, placement of him in solitary confinement was cruel and unusual, that it was retaliation for his being a jailhouse lawyer, uh, for being an activist, uh, that it was unconstitutional to deprive him of the ability to communicate with his lawyers. Um, and Motley, it was a cause celeb, and Motley handled that case, and she actually uh, validated, decided for Mr. Sastre. Um, and it, it was just, uh, she, she experienced incredible blowback um, from the law enforcement community. 
uh, because of that holding and was reversed by the Second Circuit on some claims. And yet she decided the way that she did because she thought it was the right thing to do. Um, and the point that I, I will make is that um, she was way ahead of her time. And yet over time, uh, there, there are many more people who have come around to understanding that people who are incarcerated uh, retain their, their rights. They, they retain or should retain their dignity. And so th those are just two cases that are really important um, uh, because they reveal um, Motley's significance as a, a lawyer who laid the groundwork for the Civil Rights Act. Uh, and then as a judge, she implemented the Civil Rights Act uh, in important context. And then uh, she also was unafraid uh, to side for unpopular clients like Martin Zostre. Hmm, that, that's so, <laughs> a lot oh, there to yeah. even just think yeah. about. Um, I also do want to remind people listening in that uh, we will try to take some of your questions before the end if you want to use that Q&A function uh, under the, the more tab. Um, I think we have a, a couple in there now. Um, one question I wanted to get at because you were talking about gender in some of her uh, opinions. What do you think, is there any indication of what she might think of the current Supreme Court and specifically their decision recently to overturn abortion access? Is there anything maybe in her history where you would think if she were on the court, what would she be thinking about what's going on now? Hmm. Um, interesting question. I, I do know that Motley was concerned when the Supreme Court years ago uh, started making it harder and harder for um, litigants to pursue civil rights claims, um, she was she was concerned about um, justices who did not have a sense of historical uh, awareness about the the country's. Um, racial history and uh, history of uh, exclusion and disadvantaging of women. Um, she did not decide any cases relating to um, reproductive justice, and yet there's every reason to think uh, that uh, because of the, the cases that she did rule in, which a lot of them had to, were uh, constitutional cases or um, uh, statutory cases dealing with discrimination that she believed um, that that women were full citizens, and she believed um, uh, that you know, if one wanted to to be a parent and a mother, it was important to be supported in that. Uh, I, I don't know anything uh, about her specific views on uh, choice, but she um, she was a person, a judge who. Uh, was she called them like she saw them, um, every case, uh, and yet she retained a, a sense uh, of um, wanting to ensure that historically marginalized groups uh, got a, a fair uh, hearing in, in the courts. And, and I would imagine that um, uh, she would probably be uncomfortable with the uh, uh, supermajority. Um, uh, of uh, justices who um, some of them don't don't seem very attuned to um, those considerations. Hmm. Um, I'm going to bring in some of the questions in the Q and A. Uh, this is from James Nofseeker. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing that right, James. And I'm going to paraphrase your question here. Um, is is there a moment in her life when she told herself full torpedoes full speed ahead. God bless her powerful example and gifts. So I, I'm guessing that means, was there a moment in her life or history where she just felt like, you know, this is a lot? <laughs> and, and what did she do with that? Hmm. Well, I'm sure there were many moments when she, she felt that way. Um, for instance, she was not happy about the um, the motion for recusal of her in the 
Blank versus Sullivan and Cromwell case, and there were many more um, of similar stripe, just assuming that uh, because of her identity, um, some aspect of her identity, that she, she couldn't be a judge. There were people, lawyers, who challenged her um, and who were disrespectful to her uh, when she was uh, presiding on the bench. And she just sat there like a stone uh, to, to, to uh, quote one of her law clerks. She never let um, anyone see her sweat, if you will. Uh, and yet she did become exasperated. Um, uh, but, but overall, this was a person of, um, tremendous resilience, uh, and, and who knew exactly who she was. Uh, she, she knew, uh, her ability and she had a sense of mission. A in fact, one of the things that I hope to convey in that chapter about the Meredith case, the University of Mississippi case, is that they both had a sense of mission. Uh, and and that that was a theme of of that chapter and really of her life um, uh, that she she was doing what she could with what she had and understood that um, she was opening doors for for other people through um, the symbolism uh, but also the substance of her work. We have another question from Thomas Watley. Would you discuss further when Justice Marshall selected Greenberry to lead LDF rather than Motley and her feeling over time about that decision? Hmm. So this was in 1961 when Marshall was leaving the NAACP Legal Defense Fund for an appointment to the court. And the question was who would be his successor? And there were many lawyers, Black lawyers, um, who thought that uh, one of them would be selected, excellent lawyers. Motley was among them. Um, uh, Marshall instead threw his weight behind Jack Greenberg, who also was an excellent lawyer, um, who was, um, was white and was a man. And Motley thought that her gender had been a disadvantage. And there were those who thought that race also played a role in the decision. And to, um, to shed some light on that, uh, you know, Marshall had, uh, when he was nominated to the court, he had quite a time because there was a sense that if you had been a civil rights lawyer, you were some kind of radical. And even that you, you, you must dislike whites if you um, litigated those kinds of cases. And so there was this sense that um, he was making a statement that was helpful to himself um, uh, to select Jack Greenberg. But the point of that episode, in my view, is not to indicate if, if Marshall got it right. It's really to tell the story from um, Motley's perspective and to specifically note um, the gender component, um, and it, it, there's, I, I do conclude that there's every reason to think that, of course, gender would have been a factor um, in that decision, if not directly, then indirectly, because, of course, women didn't play roles um, uh, like that one at that time. Uh, you know, th there was a woman heading the ACLU or some other comparable organization. And had she been Marshall's successor, that would have been an extraordinary progressive move on his part. Uh, so, so I tell that story um, not to besmirch Marshall and certainly not Greenberg, but to center gender as a category of analysis um, in history. And uh, of course, I also want to point out that although Motley was disappointed in Marshall's decision, uh, she had so much admiration for him and they remained friends. He had given her an opportunity and it really made her career. In fact, she said over and over again, had it not been for Thurgood Marshall, no one ever would have heard of Constance Baker Motley. Mm. Yeah, uh, 
I know, I, and I believe this is in the book toward the end, you talk about a historian or an, another author who has said that she might have been the first Black woman on the Supreme Court. Was it that moment with the uh, decision by Marshall? Was that sort of a pivotal moment that took her away from that trajectory? Well, that was speculation. You know, she was on, um, she, she was uh, cited in, in news reports uh, as a prospective nominee. I think there are so many factors that, uh, and so many iterations of politics that color those decisions that I, I, I don't think that that moment was uh, dispositive, but certainly it would have been tremendous for, for her. And I do think that she would be better known today had she been selected for that position. But um, it, she she went on to do great things. And in fact, I would argue that her failure to secure that promotion is what one of the factors that um, played into her decision to enter politics. And she was able to break barriers there. And uh, her short stint in politics, I do think, colored her understanding of, of judging. Uh, she understood that judges, certainly at the district court level, play distinct roles in our, our judicial system from, say, advocates. Um, although people like the, the lawyer for Sullivan and Cromwell did, did not believe that she she got it. In fact, she did more than most. Actually, there's a perfect segue to uh, the next question. It's from Mark Siegel. He asked if you could talk about her political career. So she was Manhattan Bureau president. If you could talk about how she came to that position and just what are some brief highlights from her role in that position? Sure. So first she was selected or elected to the New York Senate um, where she was it was notable that she supported social welfare initiatives and also was a voice against um, no knock warrants, um, which were debated you know, in the early 1960s. And then she became Manhattan Borough President, where the importance of that role um, was control or influence on the budget of, of the city. Um, which which is tremendous. And through that uh, position, she was able to ensure um, funding for social welfare programs, for the revitalization of, of Harlem. Uh, she was called upon and did uh, speak out in various instances of unjustified police killings, or violence, brutality uh, against uh, African Americans in New York, um, and of course, it was really important that she was a bear. She was a symbol of the uh, beginning uh, and the possibilities that were presented by the women's liberation movement, which she preceded, and yet she was on that at that entering wave and was friends, as I mentioned, with Shirley Chisholm, with Bella Abzug, who was her, uh, her classmate at Columbia Law School. And so it was a significant period, not a long one, but significant, because it shows how versatile she was. It also shows that in each of those distinct uh, moments in her career, she found ways to express her commitment to social justice and racial justice. And uh, it's important, it seems to me, to to have pointed that out. Hmm. Is there anything I know, you know, when you are writing a, a long story or book or doing so much research, I, I know this as a journalist too, it, there, there are moments where you need some inspiration and encouragement to just keep going and, and tackle um, something as uh, big as letting people know about a historical figure that they may not know about. Were there any moments while you were writing the book um, that served as inspiration for you, personal inspiration that you could share with all of us about her? Hmm. Well, I will say that it, it is um, it was important for me to appreciate her humanity, which I saw through um, 
research about her family relationships. You know, she traveled to Nevis every year and she did that because she always thought of it as her, her, you know, her homeland uh, of her parents' people. And she would go there and just relax, get away from it all. It was important to, to see that um, in part because there was something so formidable about her and she was such a hard worker. And it was just delightful to see that she actually took time um, and, and that she did value those relationships. I mentioned her interactions with her law clerks. Um, I was delighted to read about how she would invite them to her summer home in Connecticut uh, where they had family style meals where the rule was that they could talk about anything other than work. Uh, she really wanted it to be an opportunity for them to feel at ease. And uh, she was maternal in a sense with them. Um, I was delighted to, to learn about that. She had a, um, a pretty egalitarian marriage uh, at a time when that just wasn't a, a norm at all. A husband who was very supportive of her, who co-parented. Um, and so it was learning about the woman as a whole, uh, aside from her achievements, that was inspiring for me, uh, invigorating. Um, and also, I, I really like and, and value that she sought to give back. Um, she never forgot her journey. And uh, it, it, was, it was a good thing to, to uh, read about um, and to write about that aspect of her. Yeah, I, I want to get to you for any closing comments you have, uh, but I want to thank everybody for joining us today. There's so much in her history that we could touch on uh, in this hour, and thank you for giving us uh, this overview. Uh, and I also want to thank our co-sponsors today and also let everyone know that there will be a link uh, to the recording for this if you'd like to watch it through later. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Dean Brown, Megan. Are there any closing remarks that you have? Well, thank you for having me. As I wrote in the introduction to my book, one of my aspirations was really to make Constance Baker Motley a household name um, because I think she deserves it as a historical figure, but I also think that there's so much for all of us to learn about her, to uh, appreciate her courage, her resilience, her brilliance, uh, and so I'm happy to send this book out into the world at this particular time and am thrilled that it, the publication happened to coincide with the selection and confirmation of Justice Katanji Brown Jackson. Um, thank you for allowing me to talk about my work. All right. Thank you. And thank everyone else for coming this evening and take care. Take care.